Namaskar. A warm welcome to World News and Indian Perspective on All India Radio. This is Gaurav Sharma and with me is Saira Mujtaba bringing glimpses of the major developments of the day from across the globe. Over the next half an hour, we shall bring you the latest from the world of politics, economy, sports, entertainment and more. The Headlines Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaffirms India's focus on a free, open, inclusive Indo-Pacific and ASEAN centrality in the region. New Delhi expresses concern over China's land boundary law and its implications for peace and tranquility along the LAC. Latest emissions gap report predicts 2.7 degrees Celsius global temperature rise this century. UN chief Antonio Guterres calls upon G20 nations to deliver at COP26. World Food Program warns of acute suffering and hunger spiraling out of control in Afghanistan. UN Security Council holds emergency meet on Sudan, calls for immediate release of detainees in the military coup. Oman adds Covaxin to the list of approved vaccines for travel to the country. And in the T20 World Cup, England beat Bangladesh by eight wickets in Abu Dhabi. As India has created history by vaccinating 100 crore people against COVID-19, All India Radio salutes all the doctors, nurses, other frontline workers and all those who got vaccinated and made this possible. Even though the country has achieved this feat, we caution our listeners that the battle against COVID is not over yet. We appeal to our listeners to get fully vaccinated at the earliest and also help others get vaccinated. During the festival season, please follow these three simple steps. Wear a face mask, maintain Doga Skiduri for social distancing, and focus on hand and face hygiene. For any COVID related information and guidance, contact the National Healthline numbers 011 and 1075. And now, the news in detail. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Wednesday reaffirmed India's focus on a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific and the principle of ASEAN centrality in the region. He said this while participating in the 16th East Asia Summit hosted by Brunei through video conference. In a series of tweets, Mr. Modi said, India remains committed to strengthening respect for shared values of multilateralism, rules-based international order, international law and sovereignty, and territorial integrity of all nations. The Prime Minister added that he is looking forward to participating in the 18th ASEAN India Summit on Thursday. The East Asia Summit is the Premier Leader's led forum in the Indo Pacific. Since its inception in 2005, it has played a significant role in the strategic and geopolitical evolution of East Asia. Apart from the 10 ASEAN member states, The East Asia Summit includes India, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, United States and Russia. India, being a founding member, is committed to strengthening the East Asia Summit and making it more effective for dealing with contemporary challenges. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden announced the intention to launch an over $100 million program for cooperation with ASEAN. Speaking at the annual U.S. ASEAN Summit on Tuesday, Mr. Biden asserted that the United States strongly supports the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific and a rules-based regional order. Elsewhere, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced an additional 10 million doses from its domestic supply with ASEAN countries by mid-next year. Speaking at the ASEAN Australia Virtual Summit on Wednesday, the Prime Minister stressed its enduring partnership for an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. India has expressed concern at China's unilateral decision to bring about a legislation which can have implications on existing bilateral arrangements on border management as well as on the boundary question. In response to media queries, External Affairs Ministry spokesperson Arindam Bakchi said, Such unilateral move will have no bearing on the arrangements that both sides have already reached upon, whether it is on the boundary question or for maintaining peace and tranquility along the LAC in India-China border areas. He said India also expects that China will avoid undertaking action under the pretext of this law, which could unilaterally alter the situation in the India-China border areas. 
China on Saturday passed a new law outlining how it patrols its land border with 14 other countries. The land borders law, which will come into effect from the 1st of January, comes even as China's bordering nations call out China's belligerent stance regarding both its land and maritime borders. Mr. Bakchi said India is aware that China has passed a new land boundary law on 23rd of this month. He noted that the law states, among other things, that China abides by treaties concluded with or jointly acceded to by foreign countries on land boundary affairs. It also has provisions to carry out reorganization of districts in the water areas. Elsewhere, China has put up fences and wires in Nepal's territory in Humla district. A report by a study panel formed by the Nepalese Ministry of Home Affairs made several recommendations identifying the problems along the Nepal-China border in Humla, from border pillar numbers 4 to 13. The report also notes that since the 1963 boundary protocol, the territory belongs to Nepal. The panel report also said that the Chinese side has also been obstructing Nepalese citizens from grazing their cattle in the areas concerned. India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh underlined the emergence of transnational threats such as terrorism, piracy, drug trafficking and climate change for the Indo-Pacific region. He was addressing the inaugural session of Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue 2021 through video conferencing on Wednesday. The rise of serious threats such as terrorism, piracy, drug trafficking and climate change had thrown new challenges for our Indo-Pacific region. The nature of these challenges in the region has considerably transnational implications which require a cooperative response. Therefore, a need to find convergence of interests and commonality of purpose on maritime issues. The Defence Minister stressed on the need to find convergence of interest and commonality of purpose on maritime issues. Mr. Singh said India is committed to, to respecting the rights of all nations as laid down in the UN Convention on the Law of Seas. Meanwhile, External Affairs Minister of India Dr. S. J. Shankar stressed on the need to de-risk the world from concentrated production and fragile supply chains in a post-COVID era. He called for an openness of mind and acceptance that there can be many pathways to approach the Indo-Pacific. The World Food Programme, WFP, on Wednesday warned of people suffering from acute food insecurity in Afghanistan. At a press conference, the WFP representative and country director in Afghanistan, Ms. Mary Ellen McGroarty, said that since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan on the 15th of August, wheat has seen a 28% increase, while the price of fuel has doubled. Skyrocketing prices are pushing out pushing food out of reach for millions of cash-strapped Afghans, she added. 8.7 million people are in what we term emergency levels of food insecurity, one step away from starvation. There is a tsunami of destitution, incredible suffering and hunger spiraling out of control across Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that the current situation in Afghanistan is the logical result of two decades of the U.S.-NATO model of state development. The minister was speaking at a ministerial meeting with Afghanistan's neighboring countries, namely China, Iran, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan on Wednesday. The UN Security Council met on Tuesday behind closed doors in New York to discuss the escalating crisis in Sudan. UN Secur Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Tuesday renewed his call for the immediate release of all those detained in the military coup. Pro-democracy demonstrations continued in the country's capital Khartoum after the army dissolved the transitional government and detained civilian Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdouk and his cabinet. The UN chief said it was true that Sudan had achieved important milestones and these cannot be reversed. Meanwhile, the African Union has suspended Sudan from all of its activities until the civilian-led transitional authority is restored. It said Monday's coup was unconstitutional. Demonstrations against the military takeover are continuing for a third day in the capital Khartoum. Trade unions representing doctors and oil workers say they are joining the protests. Earlier, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, spoke on the phone to the deposed Prime Minister following his return home. Abdullah Hamdouk was arrested during the coup. 
The United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP, has warned that the current commitments to cut greenhouse gas emissions are insufficient in averting a climate catastrophe. In its latest emissions gap report titled, The Heat is On, UNEP stated that the G20 member countries are not on track to achieve either their previous or new 2030 climate pledges. A report. The Emissions Gap Report is the latest in the series of scientific reports after the IPCC 6th Assessment Report and the WMO's Greenhouse Gas Bulletin warning that humanity is running out of time to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. Taking note of the report, UN Chief Antonio Guterres, speaking at a high-level meeting on climate action, said that government's actions so far are not enough to meet the Paris targets. G20 leaders in particular need to deliver the time has passed for diplomatic niceties. If governments, especially G20 governments, do not stand up and lead this effort, we are headed for terrible human suffering. But all countries need to realize that the old carbon burning model of development is a death sentence for their economies and for our planet. On Monday, the UN weather agency WMO, in its latest greenhouse gas bulletin, found that we are way off track in terms of limiting temperature increase. Secretary General of the WMO, Professor Petteri Talas, said that roughly half of the CO2 emitted by human activities today remains in the atmosphere. We are now heading towards COP26 and that's going to be a very important meeting and we are expecting to do, get more commitments from countries to reduce their emissions. So far we have heard uh, lots of political support for enhanced uh, ambition of mitigation, but the concrete pledges have still been missing. And at the moment, we are heading towards uh, 2.5 to 3 degrees warming rather than 1.5 to 2 degrees. The UK, which holds the presidency of the COP26 summit on Monday, published the Climate Finance Delivery Plan. The new outlook states that the goal will be met from 2023. This is three years later than what was committed to by the developed countries at the Paris summit in 2015. As we approach the COP26 summit in Glasgow, science has given a clarion call for more ambitious, concerted and urgent steps, particularly by the developed countries, towards climate action. Abhishek Mukhopadhyay for World News, AIR. India's Environment Minister Bhupendra Yadav said that it is now or never for concrete global actions to address climate change. The minister echoed the sentiment of the UN chief, speaking at the Middle East Green Initiative Summit 2021 in Riyadh on Tuesday. He underlined the need to consider the state of development, historical responsibility, equity, national circumstances and priorities, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities to address the challenges of climate change. Oman has added co-vaccine to its list of approved vaccines for travel to the country. The Indian embassy in Muscat in a statement said that all passengers from India who have received two doses of co-vaccine at least 14 days before the travel date will be able to travel to Oman without the requirement of quarantine. The statement added that all other COVID-19 related requirements shall be applicable for such passengers. With this, Covaxin joins the Covishield vaccine which was already on Oman's list of approved vaccines. India's Apex Court, the Supreme Court on Wednesday, ordered a probe into the Pegasus surveillance case by a three-member expert committee. The committee will be headed by retired Supreme Court Judge Justice R. V. Ravindran. The Supreme Court will monitor the functioning of the committee. A bench comprising Chief Justice of India N. V. Ramana, Justice Surya Kant and Justice Hima Kohli observed there has been no specific denial by the Centre on the issue. The court said while there are restrictions on the right to privacy, the same are bound by constitutional safeguards. The Apex Court said restrictions on privacy can be imposed only for prevention of terrorist activities in the interest of national security. This is All India Radio giving you the news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on the India ASEAN Summit and East Asia Summit as a fillip to India's Act East policy. In conversation are Skantayal, former diplomat, and Nilova Roy Chaudhary, journalist. 
East Asia Summit is the premier leaders-led forum in the Indo-Pacific. And since its inception in 2005, it has played a significant role in the strategic and geopolitical evolution of East Asia. To take us through this crucial importance of this interaction, we are joined today by Ambassador Skantayal. What is so important about this forum that makes it a compulsory feature of India's foreign policy outreach? In East Asia, there is uh, no other forum where strategic issues are discussed. In my experience, these summits are really a good forum because the leaders of the countries can come together physically and discuss things informally. But unfortunately, in a virtual format, that possibility would not be there and leaders would be making formal statements. So in my view, these uh, summits lose one of very critical aspects of uh, the interaction. What we have seen uh, in the last few years is that uh, East Asia Summit as well as ASEAN, they have become rather tame organizations and they are unable to deal with very complex problems which East Asia is uh, facing, whether uh, it is the South China Sea issue, whether it is COVID issue, Indo-Pacific. The feeling is that uh, the East Asia Summit was supposed to play a very important role in harmonizing differences Mm -hmm. and giving a direction to the East Asian leaders so that peace, stability, and harmony remains undisturbed in East Asia. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, perhaps East Asia Summit Forum has not been able to deliver very well in that direction. One of the forums that has perhaps delivered more effectively is the India ASEAN Forum. And Prime Minister Modi will also be attending, again, unfortunately, virtually, the 18th ASEAN India Summit, which is being held tomorrow on October the 28th. Here, of course, as we know, the heads of state and government of ASEAN countries attend this day-long summit. And uh, this is going to be Prime Minister Modi's ninth ASEAN India Summit and uh, the second one held virtually. Now, as you were saying, uh, the East Asia Summit has not been terribly effective in some ways, but ASEAN at its recent uh, regional summit actually took the very important step to uphold uh, democracy when it refused to allow the Myanmar army chief to attend the summit. And the commitment to uphold democracy is among the many areas that bring India and the ASEAN together. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. India-ASEAN summit has its own logic, its own history, and its own achievements. Now, in uh, 2022, it will be the 30 years of Mm India-ASEAN relations. And the summit, uh, Prime Minister Modi and the leaders of uh, 10 ASEAN countries will review the progress made in the last one year and also Mm -hmm. give the roadmap for the coming year. And yes, it is very heartening that uh, ASEAN leaders have been able to come together and send a very strong signal to the government of uh, Myanmar that they should honor the democratic principles and human rights principles. Otherwise, they will not be welcome in ASEAN. And uh, as a strong democratic country, India would very much welcome this very decisive step taken by ASEAN. So, Skan, uh, the, the summit will review the status of the strategic partnership between India and ASEAN. What exactly are the primary areas of focus on the agenda this time? Post-COVID economic recovery would be one of the very major uh, topics for discussion. Of hmm. course, COVID-19 and health, because COVID-19 is still not gone away. Fortunately, Mm. most of the East Asian countries have this under control, but Mm. it has not gone away. Connectivity continues to be a major concern for India. And now with Myanmar coming again under more and more sanctions, the connectivity through Myanmar, trilateral highway, there will be question marks. India has also been focusing on education and culture. But the main issue where India may 
try to get some uh, more uh, achievements is that india is not part of the east asian value chains in the manufacturing chains which are part of global value chains malaysia is very much there indonesia is there other countries are there but india is not there and that is why we have such huge trade deficit with uh, some countries of asean as well as with republic of korea etc and we have not uh, joined the comprehensive rcep regional right. comprehensive economic partnership which was a little bit of a setback in uh, deepening economic and investment relations between india and asean but we have very good reasons for that and main of course is that we cannot allow backdoor entry to chinese goods so we'll have to strengthen our bilateral fta free trade agreement with asean india has a separate fta with asean and also with individual ftas with the 10 asean member countries so all these would need to be strengthened and that would be the future course of action perhaps which the two lead, lead, uh, leaders uh, prime minister modi and asean leaders will decide so uh, when we talk about not being part of the value chain for example how exactly can that be facilitated by this and other summits and and you know meetings between ministers and and senior officials what steps at this point uh, for example can india be taking to become a more integral part of this value chain that's my first question and the second one is do india and asean countries also discuss issues like the south china sea and you know things like china's issues in the south in the pacific in the pacific region does that also come up at the 17th summit in november 2020 prime minister modi had clearly uh, indicated that uh, diversification and resilience of supply chain is uh, very very important so that countries do not become over dependent on one manufacturing uh, country like china so all the countries recognize this and some countries like vietnam and thailand they have already benefited by this diversification so india needs to cooperate more and also india needs to examine why 30 40 billion dollars of foreign direct investment has come to vietnam and mm. what facilities vietnam is offering which the foreign investor are not finding in india so we have to do lot of homework but the government is determined our government mm. is decisive and mm. i am sure that gradually india will become as competitive as some other countries like in asean like indonesia vietnam thailand malaysia are for foreign investment on okay. political issues like mm. south china sea these are discussed in a formal way but again i would say it is more effective to discuss in informal way physically and then there can be very candid exchange of views which is not possible in a virtual format culture is one of the other areas that really binds india and the asean together i mean buddhism being one of the aspects so i remember uh, sushma swaraj ji saying it was culture civilization and connectivity which are the three c's of the india asean partnership how uh, would you elaborate a little more on these aspects please very much so the cultural connectivity has been there for uh, almost uh, 2000 years with the uh, trading and first buddhism and in some ways uh, hinduism and in many ways islam also traveled through india to some asian countries through the arab traders first came to kerala etc and then went to asean and once i was attending a asean cultural function and out of 10 members six members presented some part of ramayan as mm-hmm. a dance drama or as a skit or as a song so that really is a great uh, connectivity a great cultural uh, connect we have with the people of asean so the ground is very fertile for closer economic integration on strategic uh, integration i will say that uh, asean countries are very much dependent on china for their trade for their economic prosperity the china asean trade was last year 732 billion dollars and india's trade with asean was less than 100 billion dollars 
so one can see where the interests of ASEAN countries are there and what so if one observes the statements coming out from ASEAN as a group we can see that they are very reluctant to make any statement which in any way questions china's uh, assertiveness and even on south china sea issues because of china's aggression many members of ASEAN themselves are getting affected their territorial and maritime sovereignty is being questioned and attacked by china for instance of vietnam of philippines of malaysia of indonesia i'm afraid we've run right out of time i'm very sorry thank you very much indeed for all of your insights thank you thank you and moving on to sports now in the t20 world cup namibia won against scotland by four wickets at sheikh zayed cricket stadium abu zabi namibia scored 115 runs for the loss of six wickets Batting first, Scotland scored 109 for 8 in the stipulated 20 overs. Namibia had won the toss and elected to field. In another match, England beat Bangladesh by 8 wickets at the same venue. Bangladesh won the toss, elected to bat and set a target of 125 runs. England achieved the target losing 2 wickets with 35 balls remaining. AIR is broadcasting ball by ball commentary of the World Cup matches. And now a report from the business world. Amongst global stock markets, Asian stocks slid with new regulatory worries, sparking the steepest sell-off in seven weeks for Chinese tech shares. Hong Kong's Hang Seng declined 1.6 percent, and China's Shanghai Composite Index fell 1 percent. South Korea's Kospi slipped 0.8 percent, and Japan's Nikkei 225 fell marginally to close almost flat. Singapore's Straits Times Index managed to add 0.4 percent. European markets were also down in intraday trade. Global oil prices fell more than 1 percent amid rise in U.S. crude stockpiles. In intraday trade, Brent crude was trading around $85.50 per barrel. And in the foreign exchange market, the rupee depreciated by seven paise to trade at 75 rupees and three paise against the U.S. dollar. Arjun Chaudhary for World News, All India Radio. And now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Washington Post writes Facebook staff lamented perverse incentives for media. The Wall Street Journal reports that US takes Bitcoin mining crown after China crackdown. The Globe and Mail writes that Japanese prime minister's push to restart country's nuclear power plants faces resistance ahead of election. Gulf Times writes US FDA advises back Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for children. And Sputnik News writes Putin wants East Asia region of arms race threat in the wake of INF treaty collapse. A quick look at the headlines once again. Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaffirms India's focus on a free, open, inclusive Indo-Pacific and ASEAN centrality in the region. New Delhi expresses concern over China's land boundary law and its implications for peace and tranquility along the LAC. The latest emissions gap report predicts 2.7 degrees Celsius global temperature rise this century. UN chief Antonio Guterres calls upon G20 nations to deliver at COP26. World Food Program warns of acute suffering and hunger spiraling out of control in Afghanistan. UN Security Council holds emergency meet on Sudan calls for immediate release of detainees in the military coup. Oman adds co-vaccine to the list of approved vaccines for travel to the country. And in the T20 World Cup, England beat Bangladesh by 8 wickets in Abu Dhabi. India is celebrating the 152nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan by artists from Jamaica. वैष्णव जन तो तेरे का ही ये दिल पीर पराई जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो मन अभिमान ना रे वैष्णव जन
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.